I'm a uh, research affiliate the Science, Technology and Society program at MIT, but um, I'm here primarily in my own capacity. I do not represent MIT in any form. Um, what I want to talk about is that this continuing collaboration uh, between universities and uh, the military establishment in this country that started with the Manhattan Project during the Second World War and has continued throughout the Cold War. So one had thought that at the end of the Cold War, we would have a debate about our priorities, that whether we still uh, would want to spend tremendous amounts of money developing new weapons that we would not need, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Sakes. We are certainly doing science to cater to the military because they are paying for it. And An MIT professor is on paid administrative leave following a review into donations the school received from convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. According to Goodwin Proctor, the law firm that conducted the investigation, Professor Seth Lloyd knew donations from the late financier would be controversial and that MIT might have rejected them. Last year, MIT's Media Lab director, Joy Ito, resigned after a New Yorker report alleged he accepted millions of dollars worth in donations from Epstein. So, Phoenix Salmon has been following this story and joins us now with more. He's a chief financial correspondent for Axios. Thank you so much Good for joining be. us. Thank you. So I think many people would have heard about the other professor, right, uh, jo Joey? Joey, yeah. And that he was forced to resign, but I don't think they know about this other sort of part to the story. Right. So explain to us the relationship that Seth Lloyd had with Epstein. So Seth, Epstein collected scientists, mm. basically. He um, was very close to Harvard. He funded a lot of science at Harvard. Um, after he was convicted of his sex crimes, Harvard distanced him distanced themselves from him and so he wound up sort of moving across Cambridge to MIT and funding a bunch of often Harvard scientists through MIT they were like co-located mm. scientists and that kind of thing Seth Lloyd was one of the um, his pet scientists who he liked to fund he gave him sixty thousand dollars just personally into his personal bank account and um, and then he would also cultivate Joey Ito, who was running the Media Lab, which is this very sort of corporate arm of MIT, um, promised him millions of dollars, and according to The New Yorker, managed to get $7 million into the MIT Media Lab via both Bill Gates, uh, who we know, and Leon Black, who runs this big private equity company. Uh -huh. Both of them are billionaires. And so there's this massive influence of Jeffrey Epstein throughout large chunks of Boston, basically. Our discussion today of this stunningly provocative book, Undercover Police Surveillance in America. And I want to ask its author, Gary T. Marks, professor of sociology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to elaborate on his statement that in starting his book, he said, I viewed undercover tactics as a necessary evil. No, strike it. He said as an unnecessary evil. But in the course of his research, he had concluded, however reluctantly, that indeed in the United States they had become a necessary evil. Holding a press conference addressing federal cyber stalking charges against six individuals. Let's listen in. Of harassment and intimidation against a middle aged couple living in Natick, Massachusetts. That couple published an online newsletter that reviewed and was sometimes critical of eBay and other e commerce companies. Jim Baugh, eBay's former senior director of safety and security, is being sought by federal agents in California, while David Harville, eBay's former director of global resiliency, was arrested this morning in New York City. They were charged with conspiracy to commit cyber stalking and conspiracy to tamper with an investigation. Four other co-conspirators, all of whom worked at eBay, were also charged with the same crimes. Stephanie Pop, 
Stephanie Stockwell, Veronica Zay, and Brian Gilbert, who notably is a former police captain with the Santa Clara, California Police Department. The complaint alleges that the victims were targeted because eBay executives were unhappy with the coverage of eBay on the couple's website. To be clear, based on the complaint unsealed today, eBay executives were not merely unhappy with the victim's coverage, they were enraged. One of those executives texted that he wanted to, quote, crush this lady, unquote, referring to the woman in the couple who ran the site, and another told Baugh, his subordinate, to, quote, take her down, unquote. The result, as alleged in the complaint, was a systematic campaign fueled by the resources of a Fortune 500 company to emotionally and psychologically terrorize this middle-aged couple in Natick with the goal of deterring them from writing bad things online about eBay. The harassment scheme had three phases, sending disturbing deliveries to the couple's home in Natick day and night, sending, sending the couple anonymous threatening messages online, and actual physical surveillance in the Boston area. Starting in August 2019, Baugh directed Pop and Zay and others to set up anonymous email accounts, cell phones, and internet connections, and use them to send harassing and disturbing deliveries to the victim's home, all paid for with prepaid debit cards. These deliveries included fly larvae and live spiders, a box of live cockroaches, a sympathy wreath on the occasion of the death of a loved one, a book of advice on how to survive the death of a spouse, pornography mailed to their next door neighbors but in the couple's names, a Halloween mask featuring the face of a bloody pig, and a pig fetus which was ordered but after an inquiry by the supplier thankfully was never sent. Simultaneously it is alleged in the complaint that Baugh and defendant Brian Gilbert had Stephanie Pop set up fake social media accounts from which they sent threats to the victims. The messages, laced with profanity, took credit for the deliveries and were intended to look like messages from people who actually sell on eBay and who disapproved of the couple's website's coverage of the company. I'm not gonna read these publicly because they're really profane. They're quoted verbatim in the complaint that was unsealed today. I'll give you a mild example, one from a Twitter private message to the couple on August 7th, 2019, saying, quote, what it going to take for you to answer me? Guess I'm going to have to get your attention another way, bitch, close quote. Another tweet on August 10th came 14 minutes after the bloody pig mask was delivered to their residence. It said in all caps, quote, do I have your attention now? In the third phase, Baugh, Harville, and others flew from California to Boston to physically surveil the couple at their home and around Natick, Massachusetts. This allegedly included trying to break into the couple's garage so they could install a GPS on their car. Before the trip, Baugh and others practiced installing a GPS on a Toyota RAV4 in the eBay parking lot. Over the next few days, the defendants followed the victims in a series of rental cars. They would swap them out. Meanwhile, the online harassment continued and worsened. On August 18th, just after midnight, the defendants posted a classified ad on Craigslist, purportedly from the couple, inviting singles, couples, and swingers, quote unquote, to their house to party after 10 p.m. each night. People were encouraged to knock on the couple's door at any time, day and night. Less than an hour later, using a fake Twitter account, the defendants publicly posted the wife's name and age, couple's home address. As I'm standing there, these four men come in and they were looking at these games on the wall, but they were staring at me. It wasn't paranoia, I wasn't imagining it. And you know, when you feel like you're gonna collapse, everything seemed like it was in slow motion. And then this guy just started filming me. Window shopping was about safety, not sales. Looking always for an obsessed former colleague who said he wanted to both love and kill her. But when the stalker couldn't stay hidden, he recruited others to follow her, to make her fear for her life. Constant thinking that, you know, someone's gonna kill me. Today, maybe it's today. 
Janice constantly checks who's nearby after years of being gang-stalked in Liverpool. To protect her identity, how she looks now, she's portrayed by an actress and we've changed her name. This is how she described the moment the gang first appeared. I had it a game I was taken back to a shop and there was this really long queue and as I'm standing there, these four men come in and they were looking at these games on the wall but they were staring at me. It wasn't paranoia, I wasn't imagining it. And you know, when you feel like you're gonna collapse, everything seemed like it was in slow motion and then this guy just started filming me. And then he like smirked. Never seen any of them before ever. I felt literally trapped. If they're so brazen to do that in front of me, what else could they do? Janice's steps have been traced repeatedly, yet those who block exits, bump into her, terrify her, have never been caught. By the time she's begged shop staff or security to call police, they've fled. CCTV footage hasn't helped. Her original stalker's untraceable. Could we look at which barristers um, are available with stalking expertise? Solicitor Rachel Horman helps stalking victims nationwide from her practice in Blackburn. She says gang cases aren't unheard of. I've got several cases where that is happening and it makes it very, very difficult because you can't tackle all of them. You don't even know who they all are. Um, and, and psychologically, for a victim, it, it's awful because every time they leave the house, everybody is a potential stalker because they don't know who they are, who they're looking for. And it can make people become quite paranoid, understandably, uh, and they just stop trusting anybody or stop leaving the house. So it really is horrific. The stalker has told a particular story about the person, then everyone else could feel completely justified in joining in the campaign. Dr Jane Monkton-Smith understands the psychology of gang stalking. The expert on methods to stop stalkers says some build a fictional backstory of love lost. Sometimes people will be drawn into helping because they think they're doing the right thing. They might have been told a story that, look, I really like this girl and I think if I just can get her attention and then the friend will go and say, well, just talk to him, he's lovely. And before you know it, that person's involved in the stalking campaign without even knowing it. Some people get involved for other reasons, but I think most people have no idea of the impact. A life lived on edge is the impact on Janice, lived away from anywhere she believes the gang could spot her, lived in fear she could join those for whom stalking ends the worst way. Women feel like they're slowly being murdered. Well, I feel like that and I can't, I feel like I can't tell anyone that. That nightmare's never ended for me. I'm in San Francisco to meet with Nefarious Jobs, whose murky business is revenge for hire. John? Hey, how are you? Andy, thanks so much for meeting me. Oh, no problem, glad to. Have you done any cases of revenge in Australia? Yes. Uh, how many? Probably not as many as I'd like, in all honesty. We've only done maybe 10 to 15 in Australia. You try and find one person who hasn't gotten really satisfying revenge and not felt better. Everyone does, believe me, I've seen it. And when people come to us, they're looking for real resolution to real problems. I mean, some of these people have been cheated out of millions of dollars sometimes. Uh, some of them have had their hearts torn apart by cheating uh, relationships. Uh, and they're looking for someone who can assist them in, in a different type of therapy, you might say. I am John Winters. I'm the CEO of Nefarious Jobs. But John Winters isn't your real name, is it? No. So how does one get started in the business of revenge? The first month I did do away with a lot of uh, misconceptions about the work we did. Because a lot of people wanted services that we just don't provide. And number one is that we're leg breakers or that we do anything physical. The second one is that we're just, you know, uh, little pranks, you know, little things that annoy people. We don't do that either. As we sit and talk in a rented office downtown, it turns out my assumption that they're hackers is somewhat misleading. Nefarious jobs are more like private investigators crossed with smear merchants. John says his background is in law enforcement and says all types of clients come to him for all types of reasons. The ex-wife who's upset about, you know, her husband leaving and, and wants, to, wants to see what can be done about it. Or you're going to get the business partner who has been, you know, completely screwed over and forced out of his company. And one of our first questions is, do you have any information regarding 
any illegality performed by the subject. Oh yeah, they like to go out and snort coke every Friday night, you know, at so-and-so strip club. Or, you know, they're involved in insider trading, you know, and, and, and I've got these documents to prove it, that they own a shell company that's trading under this. No problem, give us that. Next thing you know, it's in the hands of the SEC. The question over what they actually do to people for money is best answered by what packages they offer. A menu of dishes best served cold. Lowest Lobo is definitely going to be revenge against an ex. We charge eighteen fifty for that. Like, let's say uh, you have an ex and, and gave you herpes. Uh, we will take an STD kit. Mm -hmm. It is a big, huge package with a big medical cross on a big red one. And we'll send it directly to their job with their name right on it. Before you know it, it's wildfire all over the office. We have Reputation Shredder. That's about a $2,300 package. First, intensive background investigation, usually with a man on the ground following. We try and dig up whatever possible dirt we can. And it has to be true now. Or it has to be the, the statement of the client. And we'll post that everywhere. And good luck getting it taken off of 5,000 websites. When you start getting into the works project, that is where we, that's where my teams really, really begin to shine. We put private investigators on four different aspects of their lives. The works you have to understand is not available for anyone under 30 years of age. And that's because of the psychological damage caused by these particular operations are far too severe. We figure for anyone to recover from who's under 30. I can't talk a lot about TA. That is a completely tailored operation. If they like to jet overseas and, you know, have wild flings with 10-year-old boys, we will, we will find it. We will get pictures. Total annihilation is the type of operation that doesn't end until the client says it does. It costs $10,000 and $500 a month to, for continuation. We all take bets in the office to see how long a person will last. Our longest, our four-monther, he lasted total annihilation for four months. He is now eating trash out of a garbage can somewhere in New York City. This story on our website, kcba.com. New tonight, police call it bullying on steroids. We're talking about gang stalking, but it actually has nothing to do with the gangs that you first think of. South Coast News reporter Candace Wynn learned more about the trend and how it's getting more dangerous because of the internet. It, it, it makes me feel afraid. Lawrence Gazzino claims his neighbors are gang stalking him because he plays loud music late at night and is outspoken. He said for the last year and a half, he's been systematically followed by a group of people. At one point, he said they climbed on his roof to harass him. Gazzino said he's developed a paranoia that's devastated his relationships with friends and worst of all, family. Santa Cruz Police Lieutenant Larry Richard said police are becoming more aware of gang stalking because of cyber bullying. But what is gang stalking? Basically, the victims could be driving their car or talking on their phones or walking the streets when a group of people try to systematically terrorize them. Richard said gang stalking is nothing new, but new technology is making it more common. Gang stalking itself, they have elevated themselves to technology. So this is something that's been going on before the age of Facebook, Twitter, those other social websites. Uh, they just now have gone into those areas. Gazzino said he's proof that the problem isn't just online and that it can hit too close to home, a home he plans on leaving because of gang stalking. I want to be able to go to the tennis course and, and, and uh, play tennis or play, play uh, ping pong without people following us everywhere. It, it's just nerve wracking. or drone related research at universities that large number of universities in this country are dependent on funds from the Pentagon and the Pentagon is driving their research agenda. It's not that science is value free because whoever is paying you, you have to pay the piper and they, were, they are going to set and this is not, uh, it's a sort of... I think this latest story has made my head spin in a way that even the initial allegations as deeply horrifying as they were didn't. Today yet another bombshell in the Harvey Weinstein saga. 
An explosive new story in The New Yorker, written by Ronan Farrow, reports on just how far Weinstein went in allegedly trying to silence and intimidate not only his accusers, but the journalists working to expose his alleged sexual misconduct. What this story pulls back the curtain on is a set of tools that I truly did not know were available to the most powerful men in this country when they are bent on stopping allegations against them. Farrow alleges Weinstein hired elite private security agencies, at least one of which deployed undercover agents to befriend a number of his accusers in order to obtain personal information and then use it to discredit them should they decide to come forward. I have been silenced for 20 years. I have been slut shamed. I have been harassed. She said it was like the movie Gaslight. She said that she was living for a year in a world of funhouse mirrors. What is so striking about this story is just how far this effort went and how elite the operatives used were. One of those groups was Black Cube. That is an elite Israeli private intelligence agency staffed by former Mossad members in some cases. These are highly trained operatives uh, who excel in using false identities, who construct front companies to cover for their false identities. Uh, this went very, very far. How involved was he? He was directly involved, had face-to-face -face contact with investigators, approved their work plans at multiple points over the last year, was receiving reports directly from several of the firms. These were routed through his lawyers, but Harvey Weinstein was pulling the strings. PS Ops, a Los Angeles-based security firm, allegedly created detailed dossiers on various people. In one PS Ops profile of Rose McGowan, there are uh, exhaustive lists of negative internet posts about her. There are sections entitled past lovers, for instance, adverse character witnesses, people willing to say negative things. This was an all-out campaign to discredit and smear these women. Psychiatry in all of, uh, all of this time doesn't have one case report of one disease validated, not one. What they do is they meet at the American uh, Psychiatric Association, they meet in the DSM committee, Diagnostic Statistical Manual Committee, and they vote on making new behavioral and, and emotional disorders and they vote and then they start immediately calling them diseases and they tell people, they tell the public these are diseases. Total fraud. Total fraud. The actual truth about chemical balance is that it's an actual lie. Nobody has yet measured, demonstrated or created a test to show that somebody has a chemical imbalance in their brain. Period. What the American public should be thinking about is when they or their loved ones or their friends have received a psychiatric diagnosis, they should be asking the dog, cheese dog, where's the, where's the chemical test for that? Where is the objective test for this? And I guarantee you that they'll be told, uh, we don't have a chemical test for that. My name is Stephen Pettigrew, I'm a PhD student at Harvard University and I was a co-author on a technical comment in the journal of, called Science and the paper was called Estimating the Reproducibility of Psychological Science. Yeah, so there was a team of uh, several hundred psychologists who uh, went out and they identified a whole bunch of psychological experiments um, in behavioral psychology and a, a few other psychological subfields. And what they did was uh, they took these results and they replicated the studies, so they reran the experiments. And the main finding that they had, uh, they argued that they found um, very low percentage of these uh, psychology experiments successfully replicated the effects. So they took the first result in each of these hundred papers and, um, and attempted to, in a, in a totally new experiment, Experiment, tried to recover that same effect um, and, and they argued in the original paper that they uh, were successful. There was a few different metrics that they used but they were only successful in roughly a third of uh, these hundred studies.
Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to receive this award tonight, named for my dear friend and colleague, Thomas Sass. As Thomas Sass wrote years ago, the only true political virtue is obedience to authority, and the only true political sin is independence. Independence renders authority useless, and that is what infuriates it so. You've undoubtedly been told you're mentally ill for daring to say that the emperor called psychiatry has no clothes, not to mention stupid and unscientific. At least this is what some of my colleagues say about me at one university. So if this is something that has happened to you, I'm here to say that you are not alone. The controversy regarding the myth of mental illness and psychiatry is not about science or medicine, it's about power. When psychiatrists start agreeing with you, well then perhaps you ought to reconsider your position. <laughs> Something may be wrong. So I'd like to say a few disobedient things, which is especially true because I was trained as a psychologist and when a member of the profession criticizes its own, it's considered especially sacrilegious. What do we know that is true, that the cult of psychiatry keeps telling us is false? First, the idea that there is a known brain lesion causing mental illness. The truth is, we cannot tell who is mentally ill and who is not by looking at pictures of their brains or analyzing their blood. Psychiatrists had to invent their own book of diseases because pathologists would have nothing to do with them. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, the DSM, a great work of fiction. What's the difference? What's the difference between the DSM and a scientific book of disease? Every disorder in the DSM is invented. Every disease listed in a pathology textbook is discovered. Real disease is found in a cadaver at autopsy. Mental illness is not. Mental illness refers to something that a person does. Real disease refers to something that a person has. Consider this yet another way. It takes one person to have a real disease. It takes two people to have a mental illness. <laughs> if you're alone on an island, you could develop a real disease like cancer or heart disease. But you cannot develop a mental illness such as hyperactivity or schizophrenia. This is because mental illness is always diagnosed on the basis of some sort of social conflict. When people do something that others find objectionable, they can be diagnosed as mentally ill. If the person doing the diagnosing is more powerful than the person diagnosed, then there is trouble. In this sense, the diagnosis of mental illness is always a weapon. Not so when it comes to diagnosing real disease. Think of how when people get angry with one another, they inevitably resort to some kind of diagnosis. They say, you're crazy. You're mentally ill. You're paranoid. Can you imagine somebody getting angry with someone and saying, you have diabetes. You have Parkinson's disease. Social conflict has nothing to do with developing a real disease. You don't develop diabetes because someone doesn't like the way you think, speak, or behave. You have to have someone else present to judge that your behavior is morally good or bad in order to have a mental illness. So diagnosis is a weapon, a tool people use against one another especially when there is some kind of power conflict present. 
And what of treatment? Treatment for mental illness is punishment. Look at our criminal justice system. When someone commits a crime and a psychiatrist is in the courtroom, a defendant may go to a mental institution instead of a prison. Can you imagine a judge saying, I sentence you to treatment for your cancer. I submit to you that psychiatric treatment is worse than prison. For in prison they don't judge how long people should be deprived of liberty on the basis of what they think about themselves and the world. In a mental institution, of course, this is the case. If you don't think about yourself and the world correctly, you'll be punished longer. Psychiatrists love to say that mental illness is a real disease, just like cancer. The analogy between mental illness and real disease is not reciprocal. It doesn't hold both ways. Having cancer is not like being depressed. We don't shock people who have cancer to make them better, especially if they don't want to be shocked. Consider how melanoma, a deadly form of skin cancer, is a disease here as well as in northern India. If you have melanoma, does it cease to exist if you move to another country, another culture? Of course not. If you are wandering the foothills of the Himalayas and meditating for 15 hours a day, you may very well be called a holy man in India. Take that same person have him walk across the grounds of the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., and he's diagnosed a paranoid schizophrenic and committed to a mental hospital. What do you think psychiatrists would do if Jesus were alive today? Or Buddha? Or Mohammed? Bada bing! Right into a mental hospital, injected with drugs to stop their crazy beliefs and speech. Psychiatrists today are the true grand inquisitors. They would crucify the holy men and women of yesterday in an instant. My father was sent from Nazi Germany to America in 1933 when he was about 15 years old. From the time he was sent out of Germany by his family because he was a Jew until his dying day five years ago, he had nightmares that the Nazis were persecuting him. He fought against them his whole life, awake and asleep. I used to ask him, Dad, what were people thinking in Germany back then? What were they thinking when they saw the Nazis parading about? And he used to say, nobody took them seriously. Nobody believed they could ever have the power to do what they did. We laughed at them. Now, while I encourage you to laugh in the face of those psychiatrists who argue that two plus two doesn't equal four, know, too, that we must also take them seriously, especially when it comes to the harm they have done to people in the name of helping them. For if we do not, history will repeat itself. We are building a resistance to the psychiatric Gestapo, the Citizens Commission on Human Rights is an important partner in the fight for liberty and justice. That is why we are here tonight, and that is why we will be together tomorrow. Thank you.